Praise y'all. Everybody, please go ahead and be seated. We are in devil worship, the shocking facts. And we're actually in chapter three on, in this book here. And the chapter here is entitled, The, the Result of devil, devil Worship, The AIDS Epidemic. And we've kind of gone through and we've seen some of the, uh, um, you know, we've seen some of the, 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 the effects or the results of devil worship as being, uh, one of them is the continual war, vengeance, and retaliation. And this is the, this is the mark of Cain. And one of the results is we're going to delve into quite extensively uh, in this chapter is the AIDS epidemic and the result of devil worship. And uh, let me see where we're going to. On page 70 here under this heading, it says AIDS. How many is it affecting? And anybody remember when, the, when uh, they first heard about the AIDS epidemic? Anybody remember about what year that was? It was in the early 80s. I were, this is going to date me a little bit. It was in the early 80s. I was, uh, uh, if I remember right, it was my senior year in high school. It was like 1981-82. Uh, it was somewhere in that area. It was the first time that I remember hearing about this particular virus here. And it shows here, and there was an article here in Vanity Fair that was dated March of 1987. And it said, in many areas, the number of persons infected with the AIDS virus is at least 100 times greater than the reported cases of AIDS. And that's the thing to remember, men, when we're dealing with these statistics. When it shows here that, now I looked up the statistics for, uh, for, for AIDS, and the best that I could find, I think it was either 2010 or 2012. And uh, if I remember right, this came from like the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. And it shows that, or they showed that there were like 35.5 million people worldwide that are infected with this virus. Now, when you take that into account, you take into account what this article here said in Vanity Fair, that it's probably much higher than that. In reality, it, 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 in reality, it is much higher than that. They estimate that it could be as many as 100 times greater because what you're dealing with in the, with these viruses, with these diseases, you're dealing with those diseases that are reported. You're dealing with those people who are actually exhibiting symptoms that have gone and have been diagnosed with this disease. And then that gets reported to the CDC. Well, what about the people who are exhibiting, maybe are not exhibiting symptoms at all? but they're walking around with this bug, they're walking around with this virus. They're infected, but they're not reported. What about the ones who can't afford to go get diagnosed and they're having these, these symptoms or the symptoms are being misdiagnosed as something completely different? You know, all of that has to be taken into consideration when we're dealing with statistics. Um, in the same, in this, uh, you know, pastor he wrote here, he said uh, today, every day, thousands upon thousands of people are becoming newly infected with the AIDS virus. Those who already have this horrible disease are transmitting it from one to another through sexual relations or the many other means because of the ease by which this virus can be transferred from person to person. It is not this difficult to trans, or it is much, it is much easier to transmit than the people are saying, than, than what they're telling you. Um, but some of the other, some of the other uh, current, statistics, current statistics I was able to find, um, of the reported cases, they had 35.5 million, they say, uh, worldwide are infected. Well, 2.1 million of those are ages 10 to 19. And they say there's 2.3 million new infections. There were 2.3 million new infections in the year 2012. 
and they estimate that there's like 3.34 million children living with HIV, and that this number was kind of was was kind of staggering when I saw this. But there's over 700 children that are infected with HIV every day. 700 every day. That doesn't seem like very much, but I mean, over the period of a month, over the period of a year, look how many children. And it's the children. You know, what are the children? You know, how? You know. What have the children done to bring this upon themselves? And the things that make this virus, the things that make it so deadly is with the speed in which it replicates. And when it replicates, it does so very, very quickly. And this article I said, I think it shows that it, was, it, uh, it is about a thousand times faster than the, than the other genes that we know about, they say. It says, this system is very potent in permitting the viruses to replicate at a ferocious rate it is one reason that this is such a devastating disease. It is one of the reasons this virus can be transmitted so easily from person to person. You know, once a person has it, even though they don't show the symptoms, even though they don't show the signs, they're still carrying it and they still transmit it and they don't know it. Um, it shows here this, the, the list of ways that this virus can be transmitted is far reaching. The AIDS virus is found in all, and Pastor puts in their capital letters, all, A-L-L, -L, all. All bodily secretions, that means blood, uh, blood plasma, blood serum, tears, tears, saliva, urine, semen, perspiration, sweat, And it even shows here, AIDS, in fact, can be transmitted by tears, saliva, body fluids, and notice mosquito bites. And, and British AIDS expert, this John Seal, adds the AIDS virus is usually stable, usually it's unusually stable outside the human body. It retains all of its ineffectivity, infectivity after seven days in water at room temperature. After seven days, it's still infective and some after being kept dry for a week. So even if it's dry, it still has the potential of infecting. You know, this is why pastor tells us when we go out into the world, you know, when we have to go out to Walmart, when we have to go out to the stores, when we have to go out and do business to make sure we take the precautions. You know, use the essential oils, use the thieves, use these things and, and to, to help protect ourselves from these things. You know, and, you know, and if we don't have to go out, you know, if we don't have to, then, you know, then don't. Why, I mean, why would you want to put yourself in that situation of potentially contracting something like this? I, I mean, you know, would you intentionally go into a, you know, into a room where a patient, ha you know, where somebody is in there because they have an infectious form of tuberculosis? Would you willfully go into that room if you didn't absolutely have to? I would say if you went into a room and you didn't have to, knowing that that was out there, I'd think you'd be classified as a fool. Why would you want to take that risk? You know, we don't, we don't want to, don't take unnecessary risks. We don't have to do that. Now, in the first stages of this disease, Pastor shows, he says the victim becomes a carrier of the AIDS virus, and that person having this disease may appear to be in perfect health. You know, that illusion, they, they appear to be perfectly healthy. But in fact, there have been many cases of well-known celebrities who have continued to work for many years or for a few years while carrying this, this virus and also while being able to transmit their disease to others. It's impossible, or it is possible to unknowingly transmit this disease to others due to the simple reason that persons carrying this virus do not develop debilitating symptoms right away. These newly infected people may carry the virus for some experts, say, for four or five years before their symptoms become noticeable. How many people do we come in contact with on a daily basis? How many people would we come in contact with in a time period of four or five years? You see the danger. I mean, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the prophets, you know, the apostles and the prophets, they said in the last days, you know, the, he, he mentioned, it was mentioned that in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, these, we are definitely in these perilous times. Now, almost immediately after a person becomes infected, his or, body, his or her body begins shedding the AIDS virus through various bodily secretions. It is from these shed viruses that others are infected. 
many people suddenly are, are suddenly devastated with the shocking information that they or their mates have been infected with the AIDS virus. You could be sleeping with somebody who had AIDS at this very moment and you may not know it. People who are out there committing adultery and fornication, who are out there with a new partner every, you know, every weekend. The probability is very, very high that they have either this disease or some other, some other disease. This in itself is a very alarming fact, but the circumstances which have caused this world to become involved to this degree with the AIDS virus is even more frightening. The thousands of AIDS carriers which, uh, which were dealt with beginning in 1978 have now turned into the millions of carriers. And it is very possible that these millions will soon turn into the billions. Um, other experts are saying that there is no way to find a cure because of the, of the many different forms of the virus, of this virus. It changes, it mutates. You know, even other diseases, you know, even other diseases that are out there that they thought were once so-called cured, you know, these antibiotics are not working on them anymore. So it is, it, it is getting extremely, extremely dangerous. Now, AIDS, a curse with a cause. Now, the world, the world's idea of protecting somebody from this, you know, you know, Yahweh set these laws. Yahweh gave us certain laws that protect us. They protect our life. They protect our health. They, the, the, the laws of Yahweh are there to be our friend. They are there to protect us so we can live in peace, joy, and complete health when they are followed. It's when sin is taught, is when iniquity is taught, as we're going to see that this is why, you know, this is why AIDS has come into this world. You know, we're going to get into that here this evening. You know, it's because of iniquity. It's because iniquity is being taught. But the world's way to prevent HIV transmission is, one of the ways they say is practice safe sex and use condoms. Well, if you remember here a few years ago, there was a prophetic word that came out about, you know, about protection. Remember that? That was the title of the, that was the, title of the prophetic word. It said protection. There was a big old, big old protection on it. Uh, you know, the word protection. And uh, remember it had the information in there, uh, the inserts from the condom packages. Remember that? And remember what those inserts said? It said that this product is for the use of the prevention of pregnancy. It, they are not designed to protect against sexually transmitted diseases. Remember that? Remember those inserts that, in there that said that? If you haven't, if you don't remember that, go back and get it and look at that because this is part of the deception that's being taught to our young people in the world. You know, the young people in the world are being told, well, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have sex, if you're gonna go out and do this, Get, get, get you a condom for protection. Well, they're deceiving the world. You know, they're deceiving the children into thinking that by, by using this thing that they are going to be protected from diseases, which it doesn't. Remember, there, there was, a, there was a, an analogy that was given in there. Remember the analogy that was given? Remember the condoms are full of holes, right? And remember the analogy was given that the holes in the condoms are like the size, if, if, if you want to get a relative, a relative comparison, if you take a hole, if you consider a hole in a condom, when you blow it up to where it looks like it's the size of a basketball hoop, remember that analogy that was given? How big is a virus? A virus is about the size of a golf ball. Well, guess what? That golf ball is going to pass through that basketball hoop quite easily. Okay. So that was the analogy that's given. That's why they don't work, but it's a false sense of security that's being given. It's not stop the behavior. It's not, you know, it's not Yahweh's way. It's not the, the solution, you know, that Yahweh gives us for preventing these things, but it's the world's way. It's, it's their way to practice safe sex, use condom. And then they're like, and this, this stuff came from the CDC. And it says, practice safe sex, use condoms. Oh, get tested. Like that's going to do a whole lot. Get tested. Get tested for sexually transmitted diseases. Avoid the injecting of drugs. If you do, use new and disposable needles and syringes. You know, I mean, there's nothing in here. These are all, you know, 
My dad used to put it as this is nothing but a dog and pony show. Okay? It's all fluff. It's all, you know, gives the appearance that something is being done when it's absolutely worthless. There's nothing, you know, none of this, none of this is going to stop anything. The only thing that is going to stop it is that for this world to stop teaching iniquity and to start teaching these laws of health. That's what's going to stop this stuff. And this is what we're being trained for. We are being trained to be able to go out and to teach these things. Now, pastor shows here, he says, AIDS, a curse with a cause. Now, remember, a curse causeless will not come. Proverbs 26, 2, right? Proverbs 26, 2. Like a fluttering sparrow uh, and like a flying swallow will alight. You know, a bird can't stay in the air forever, right? Is it, can a bird fly around forever? No, it has to stop. It has to rest. It's, it's going to alight somewhere. So as a fluttering sparrow or like a flying swallow will alight, like it's going to land, so a curse causeless will not come. Okay? A curse is not going to come upon somebody. Consequences are not going to come upon somebody unless they've done something to bring them upon themselves. And this is exactly what we're seeing here with, the, with, the, with these diseases, with everything that we're seeing in the world. And it's not just the AIDS, but it's all of these diseases that we're seeing. It's the wars. It's the, it's the, you know, it's the violence. You know, it's all of these things. When the Apostle Shaul was inspired to write in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that the God of this world had blinded the minds of all deceived mankind so they would not believe the message, uh, the message of Yahweh. He was writing about the entire world. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 6, we find, But if our message is hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost. For the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, who do not believe, so that the light of the message of the glory of Messiah, who is in the image of Yahweh, should not shine unto them. Now, this is all going to be explained here. Pastor is going to go through and explain this point by point. For we do not preach, our, uh, preach ourselves, but Yahshua Messiah, the ruler and, uh, of ourselves, and, or, and ourselves, your servants, for Yahshua's sake. For Yahweh, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh and the face of Messiah. Now, we should have scriptures popping into our minds with everything here that Pastor has read, what, what he's pointing out here. But please notice first, it is the God of this world that has blinded the minds of the people. Please notice second, the minds of the people are blinded to the light of the knowledge of Yahweh. This knowledge which Yahweh gives us is in his law. Notice again the first part of 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Yahweh commanded the light. Well, the world is blinded because why? What's being done with the law? Remember the prophet, I think it was the prophet Isaiah said, for, he talks about in the last days that the law is suppressed, remember? Is the law suppressed today? Is the teaching of Yahweh's law suppressed today? Absolutely it's suppressed. Every church suppresses the law of Yahweh. In Psalm 119.4, Yahweh commands us to diligently keep his, his precepts. Now with this in mind, notice Psalm 119.1-7, through 7, which says, in verse 1 here, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the laws of Yahweh. Okay, not cursed, but notice they are blessed. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek Yahweh with their whole heart. Not, half, not halfway, not, ha not when it's convenient for us, not when we agree with it. But blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek Yahweh with their whole heart. And they also practice no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to diligently keep your precepts. Oh, may our behavior be constant in keeping your statutes. May our behavior be constant. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. May our behavior be constant in keeping your statutes. And it takes effort to have that whole concentration. Look at the concentration here that is needed. You know, for if we concentrate on your every commandment, we can never be put to shame. Remember the concentration that Yahshua Messiah exhibited. Remember that? Yahshua Messiah, his, 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 he, he, he sought Yahweh with his whole heart, and his, his every thought was on the keeping of the law of Yahweh, was on, on attaining that perfection, on making sure that he wasn't a part of this world in any way, shape, or form. 
And he kept that law perfectly. Our example, he showed us it can be done. And we will praise you with your uprightness of heart when we learn your righteous judgments. Now remember, the Apostle Shaul said that the God of this world has blinded the people, blinded the minds of the people to the light of Yahweh. Therefore, what the Apostle Shaul scripturally meant is the fact that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the people to Yahweh's commandments, laws, statutes, and judgments. Okay, you see that? You see how the, how Pastor walked us through and put all that together for us? That the God of this world has blinded the minds of the people to the commandments, statutes, and judgments of Yahweh. Remember how they did that? Well, those old laws are nailed to the cross. You don't have to keep those laws. You know, those were for the Jews. Those were for way back when. You know, we just, you know, we just, we just do what's right in our heart. You don't have to keep that. You see how the, how the preachers and how the teachers, the religious teachers today, have blinded the minds of the people. It's through this, this, through this deception, through tickling their ears, through telling them what they want to hear. But in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Psalm 119, 130, the unfolding of your words gives light. They give understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, 137, righteous are you, great Yahweh, upright are all your judgments. Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law is the truth. And in Psalm 119, 151, you are near, O Yahweh, all your commandments are truth. And then 119, Psalm 119, 165, great peace have they who love your law, and nothing will offend them. Nothing will offend them. After reading each of these previous scriptures and understanding the message within them, written in black and white, it's wonderful to proclaim the truth found in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, which again says... For Yahweh, who commanded the light, that is the law of Yahweh, to shine out of darkness. You know, to shine out of this sin-sick world. This, you know, the law of Yahweh is there. You know, and has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge, the law of Yahweh, of the glory of Yahweh in the face of Yahshua Messiah. Now, why has AIDS come into the world? The next section here. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of, his, of her preachers, who of course lead the people into thinking that the laws of Yahweh have been done away with and that no harm will come to anyone if they break the commandments, statutes, and laws and judgments that those old Jewish laws were nailed to the cross. Remember Satan's teaching? You're not going to surely die. You're surely not going to die. But if you, you know, you know, for Yahweh knows that if you, you know, when you, when you break these laws, you're going to be, uh, be as the gods, you know, you're going to be as the gods knowing righteousness and evil. You know, but you're not going to die. You don't have any consequences if you break these laws. That's what she was saying. The same thing that the churches teach today. They push iniquity. They teach iniquity. You, you know, they teach that you're not going to have any consequences if you break these laws. But yet we see the consequences that are bounding in the world today. And it's because of these, it's because these, these laws have been pushed aside. It's because of iniquity. The unsuspecting majority of the people in this world who have never been trained in the laws that are written in the same Bible they claim to follow do not see the harm of men committing sexual acts with men, of women with women. Yes, it, that's not just with the men, it's with women with women. Or of men, with men, of men or women with beasts. In fact, most of these people do not even know that there is a scriptural law against this abominable, disgusting kind of behavior. You know, they don't even realize it's there. This deception proclaimed by, by Satan's preachers is so strong that most people will not even read what they call the Old Testament because of what they have been led to believe by the, by the God of this world through her preachers. You know, why should I even bother reading from Genesis to, you know, from, you know, from Genesis to Malachi? Why should I even read that? It's all been done away with. It's a waste of my time. That's what they're thinking, right? You know, how many times I can remember, I can remember being in school, I can remember being in school and this the, the year, I mean, the, many, many, many years ago, probably back in the, uh, I want to say probably the, yeah, mid-70s, 
when I was in grade school, I can remember people, I can remember this old man coming to, coming to school, and this was done after school, if I remember right, he had this box with him, and he was standing at the door like a darn vulture, waiting for school to let out. And as the students were leaving the school, as the students were leaving the school, he was passing out these little books. This little book was about like this, about that long, about that tall, about yay wide. You know what it was? It was a New Testament. That's it. That's all it was. That's all that they think that they need to have for salvation. You know, they don't understand. They don't, you know, they, they, you know they, that is what they have been deceived into believing. But depending on their preacher for salvation, most people never read the so-called New Testament either. You know, which contradicts almost everything that these preachers teach. You know, even the so-called New Testament in the King James Version, you know, contradicts their teachings. In the following scriptures, we find the teachings of Yahshua Messiah and his apostles. In 1 Yachanan chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, we, in verse 7 here, we see a warning here. It says, little children, and we're all the children of Yahweh, right? We're all, you know, Yahweh looks at us all as his children. So we're not sp speaking of physical little children here, but we're talking about all of us. And it says, little children, let no man deceive you. Boy, that should, say, that should, or should be perking up all over the place. What? Let no man deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. What, there's going to be somebody out there that's going to be trying to, te trying to tell me that, uh, you know, trying to tell me something different? Look at verse 8. He who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Yahweh was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. First Yachanan 2, 4, he who says, I know him, Yahweh, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Well, if the Christians are reading First Yachanan 2, 4, you know, where, where are they going to go to find out where the commandments are? They're going to have to pull that one out of somewhere because they've done away with the books that contain the commandments. But he who says I keep his commandments, he who does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. First Yachanan 4 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of Yahweh, because many false prophets or lying creatures have gone out into this world. All sickness, Pastor shows here, all sickness is a result of sin, either directly or indirectly. It's either a direct result or it's an indirect result. Sin is the breaking of the law of Yahweh. First Yachanan 3, 4 shows that very clearly, that sin is the transgression of the law. And as long as sin remains in the world, you will continue to see hospitals full of people suffering mentally and physically from the curses of sin. Not only are you going to see them in the hospitals, but you're going to see them on the battlefields, you're going to see them in the schools. You're going to see them all over the place, everywhere. There is, not, there is not a single area that is untouched by sin, by the results of it. I mean, there, 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 it, there isn't. It's, it's everywhere. So as long as you have preachers who continue to deceive the people in this world into breaking Yahweh's law, you're going to continue to have sins committed which cause these curses. Yahweh also caused breaking his law devil worship in the following scripture. And take a look here in, in Romans 6, 16, and, uh, 6, 16 to 18. Do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves as servants to obey, his servants you are whom you obey? Okay, pretty simple, right? You belong to who you obey. Whether of sin, well, if we allow the scripture to interpret the scripture, we know sin is 1 Yachanan 3, 4 is the breaking of the law of Yahweh, Right? So, whether of the breaking of the law of Yahweh, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to Yahweh, though you were once servants of sin, you were once servants of the breaking of the law of Yahweh, you have become obedient with all of your heart to the form of teaching which was delivered to you. To the form of teaching, to the, to the laws and to the prophets. 
then been being set then being then set free from sin. Okay, this is where we got to slow down a little bit. Yeah, being set free from sin, not free to sin as the world wants you to believe. Right? The world teaches you to sin, right? The, 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 the preachers, the, the, the churches teach you to sin. They don't teach you to keep the law of Yahweh. So they're teaching you to sin. But notice we've been set free from sin, not free to sin. You have become servants of righteousness. So to become a servant of righteousness, you know, we have to be obedient to the laws, to these laws. You know, we have to stop sinning. We have to repent of sin. We have to stop. First Yachanon 3, 7 through 8 says, Little children, again, let no man deceive you. If you practice righteousness, remember righteousness, Deuteronomy 6.25 tells us righteousness, it will be our righteousness if we keep Yahweh's laws, statutes, commandments, and judgments. If you keep these laws, statutes, commandments, and judgments, you're righteous just as he, just as Yahweh is righteous. But if you practice the breaking of the law of Yahweh in complete agreement with Romans 6.16 here, he shows you are of the devil, you belong to Satan the devil. He who commits sin is of the devil. Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Now, it makes no difference if 10,000 preachers tell you that the laws of Yahweh are done away with. What they're preaching will not stop the curses. Okay? I mean, it doesn't matter if somebody's telling you, if you, confront, if you talk to somebody and somebody tells you a lie, and you know it's a lie, and you talk to them, and you tell them, look, you know, you're, you know, you're not right. You're not telling me the truth. I just saw you do something. I just saw you, I just saw you do something that you shouldn't have done. Well, in order to try to convince you that you didn't see what you saw, they're going to get louder. I didn't do it. I'm telling you, I didn't do it. Yes, but I just saw you with my own eyes. Well, no, you didn't. You didn't see that. And the more they repeat it, the more they talk about it, the louder they get, it doesn't change the truth, does it? It doesn't change the truth of what, uh, of what they're doing or, or what they had done. And so in the same manner, is it doesn't matter how many of these preachers are out there telling you it's okay that the laws of Yahweh were nailed to the cross. Because the scriptures prove them a liar. No matter how many of them gather together, no matter if there are 10,000 of them out here at the gate, you know, protesting and saying, you need to stop teaching these old laws they were done away with. Well, the book of Yahweh, Yahweh here shows very clearly, no, they weren't. And then we're going to stand on the laws of Yahweh. We're going to stand on the laws and the prophets because that is our insurance policy. Remember, we talked about, you know, we talked about here a few weeks ago that, you know, Pastor, Pastor he had mentioned that the laws and the prophets are like an insurance policy. The book of Yahweh, the written word is like an insurance policy. And if we follow those, the, the terms and conditions of that insurance policy, then when the time comes that we need to cash in on that policy, we're going to be covered. But if we believe what some lying insurance salesman tells us, that we don't have to follow a certain condition when it comes time to cash in on that policy, because we didn't follow that to the letter, guess what? We're not going to gain the benefits of that. Remember, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And we have to remember that. We have to keep that in mind. Yahweh doesn't lie. Yahweh doesn't lie. Yahshua doesn't lie. The apostles and the prophets don't lie. The last day's witness doesn't lie. And you can bet your life on that. He is going to lead you. He is leading us in the way of salvation. But it makes no difference if 10,000 preachers tell you that the laws of Yahweh were done away with. What they are preaching will not stop these curses. And it hasn't stopped these curses. If what they were teaching was going to put an end to it, the hospitals would be empty. You wouldn't have the wars. You wouldn't have the fighting. You wouldn't have the violence. You wouldn't have the bullying in the schools. You wouldn't have all of this. It wouldn't be there. It's broken. What they're teaching is broken. We know what's broken. And Yahweh has the solution. 
But Yahshua Messiah warns you over and over to beware of men who teach against the law of Yahweh. In Matthew 7, 15 through 23, we find beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Oh, yeah, they do. You know, they will come to you in sheep's clothing. That's all part of deception, remember? Kind of like that fish hook. You're not going to throw a fish hook out in the water with no bait on it. You're not going to catch a fish. It's going to sit there all day long. But you make that hook appealing, then you're going to have a fish that's going to come by and it's going to bite it. Well, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. You will know them by their fruits. You're going to know them by their character. You're going to know them by their conduct. You're going to know them by what they teach. If they teach not according to the law and the prophets, it's because there's no light in them. There's no truth in them. But likewise, every righteous free, as so you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Likewise, every righteous tree brings forth righteous fruit, but, but a fruit of evil brings forth the fruit of iniquity. A righteous tree cannot bring forth the fruit of iniquity, nor can a tree of evil bring forth the, true, uh, the, the fruit of righteousness. It can't do it. Just like an apple tree is not going to bear a pear. It won't do it. Every tree which does not bring forth righteous fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, teacher, teacher, will enter into the kingdom of Yahweh. But notice only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, teacher, teacher, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and in your name performed many wonderful works? But I will declare to them, but then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who practice iniquity. Get away from me, you who practice iniquity. In Matthew 7.22, Yahshua Messiah shows that these false prophets to be preachers. That's who they are. These false prophets, they preach or they prophesy. They even claim to cast out demons. And this is the work of the preachers. And they also speak of the many, which, which are none other than the religious establishments who say that they are all doing these wonderful works. However, Matthew 7.23 shows that Yahshua Messiah will cast these religious leaders from him calling them practicers of iniquity. And iniquity, we can see here, uh, Pastor gives us a definition here, and it shows out of, uh, out of Strong's, it was word number 458 from 459, and it shows not subject to the Jewish law, or not subject to the law of Yahweh. It's the pushing aside of the law of Yahweh. That is what iniquity is. It's lawlessness. It's not subject to these laws. As you read for yourself, the world calls these laws Jewish laws. However, the scriptures themselves call them the laws of Yahweh. We also find that those who are practiced iniquity are not subject to them. They don't submit to them. So it's plain to see that these false prophets, these false preachers, whom we are warned against are those who teach that the Savior came to do away with the wonderful laws of Yahweh. You know, the, the, very, the very things, the very laws, the very guidelines that we have that, will, that uh, will lead to great peace, great joy, you know, abundant living, health, you know, all of these things. And because of their preaching, they are leading this whole deceived world into disobedience to the laws that Yahweh had commanded. However, when one reads the scriptures for themselves, one finds that each and every one of Yahweh's servants obeyed Yahweh's every word. Okay, you can see, you know, that's, you know, that is given there, you know, and those examples are given there. In Genesis 26, 5, we said that we see that Abraham obeyed Yahweh because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my statutes, and my commandments, and my laws. Abraham obeyed. Why? Because he believed, just as we read in Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed Yahweh, and he, Yahweh, accounted, him, accounted it to him as righteousness. Remember, it's not just believing. It's just not, okay, not just being in agreement with the law, but it also has to do with following through and being and submit to the teachings that you're given. Okay, belief. You know, belief is not just a, it's just not a thought process, but it's action also. The Apostle Shaul confirms this fact, showing that Abraham followed Yahweh, saying in Galatians 3, 6, just as Abraham followed Yahweh, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Then we see in Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 2, that Yahweh commanded the same laws, statutes, and judgments to the children of Israel, which he commanded to Abraham. Now remember, earlier in, I think it was in the chapter before, 
uh, it, was, it, was, it was in the chapter before, I think it was back on page um, 35. Back on page 35. Remember we had the, there was a definition that was given of the word command. You know, the, uh, the command. Now these are the commandments. Now this command, remember this command means to set in order. It means to set in order uh, through his commandments, statutes, and judgments. And not only is, is it just is it that he that he set things in order through his commandments and statutes and judgments. It's not just that, but he also sent a teacher, a messenger to guide and instruct us in how to fulfill this and how to, and, and how to keep these commandments. So it's not just he told us how to do it. Yes, he tells us what we need to do. But he sends a messenger. He sent a teacher for us to show us and to guide us and instruct us in how to keep these things. But in Deuteronomy 6.25 here, oh, let me go back here. Um, in Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 2, it says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which Yahweh your Father has commanded me to teach you. So you can even see that here in, in, a, in, in verse 1 here. That Yahweh your Father has commanded me to teach you so that you may observe them in the land you're crossing over to possess. He didn't just give them the laws, but he taught them how to keep the laws. That was his, that was his commission to explain these things. So that you may reverence Yahweh your father by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you and your son and your son's sons all the days of your life. And that so your days may be prolonged. Now that we have read for, yourself, for ourselves that Yahweh commanded his laws, statutes, and, and judgments to Abraham and to the children of Israel, let us compare the following scriptures which say in Deuteronomy 6.25, and it will be our righteousness if. You see, Pastor, in the book here he puts in that quote, he puts that word if in quotes. Okay, this is conditional. It's a conditional statement. The law, statutes, commandments, and judgments are going to be our righteousness if we observe and do them. If we submit ourselves to them, if we put them to practice, then they're counted to us as righteousness. If we just read them and ignore them, it's of no benefit to us. They're not to our, it, it, it won't be counted to us as righteousness. But in Matthew uh, 7.17, likewise, every righteous tree brings forth righteous fruit. So again, you can see how these tie together. But a tree of evil only brings forth the fruit of iniquity. Righteousness is practicing every word which proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh, and iniquity, or doing away with Yahweh's every word, which is sin. Then, Pastor, you can see that you can see him pleading here. He says, "Please, oh, please, notice what your own Bible is telling you. You know, read it for yourself. I'm just showing you what your Bible says." He says, "The false prophets, the, the, the false prophets, the false preachers, the false teachers are those who do away with the righteousness of Yahweh." You know, he's identifying and he's pointing out scripturally who these false prophets are. It's those who do away with Yahweh's righteous laws. As Deuteronomy 6.25 has told us in no uncertain terms, living by Yahweh's every word is your righteousness if you will do it. If you will do it. There's action on our part. We have to be obedient. The world today has no righteousness because false prophets who are deceiving this world Okay? They don't have righteousness. They have our self-righteousness. They have what they deem is righteousness in their own minds. But Yahweh says that their self-righteousness is as filthy rags to him. Yahweh gives us what his righteousness is. And that righteousness becomes ours if we're submissive to it. It says, yes, because these false prophets teach that the laws of Yahweh, the righteousness of Yahweh, that every word of Yahweh is done away with, this world is most certainly deceived. The Apostle Shaul was inspired to write Romans 10, 3 through 4, for our instruction, saying, Since they, being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from Yahweh, and, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to Yahweh's righteousness, his every word. And this is what we see in the world today. You know, they are ignorant of the righteousness that comes from Yahweh because they have been deceived into thinking that, that, right, that, that those laws are done away with, that, that, righteousness, that, is, that those laws are not righteousness. So they seek to establish their own righteousness. For Yahshua Messiah is the ultimate result of the keeping of the law under righteousness for everyone who believes. Now, 
the King James Version will actually show here that this ultimate result, they actually translate the, that phrase, their ultimate result, they translate it as end. They translate it as end. And they will actually twist the scripture to try to say that Yahshua Messiah, or in their book it says, Jesus is the end of the keeping of the law for everyone who believes. So they will take that scripture and they will twist it to say, you see right there, it says that the laws of Yahweh are done away with. But when you look up the word end, it means the ultimate result, the end result, the ultimate result of the keeping of the law. And that's what Yahshua was. Yahshua was the ultimate result. It brought him to complete perfection. His submission, his, you know, his determination and submission to Yahweh in everything qualified him to be the high priest over the house of Yahweh. It qualified him and he, you know, and, and, you know, he, he qualified and because he didn't commit sin, because he wasn't deserving, because he didn't do anything to deserve the death penalty, he was able to pay that penalty for each and every one of us. That is the ultimate result. I mean, yeah, that is the ultimate result of the law of Yahweh. In Matthew 5, 17, Yahshua Messiah himself said, don't even think I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I didn't come to destroy them, but I came to establish them, to fully preach, to teach them, to magnify them, to show you how to keep these laws and to show that they can be done. These are Yahshua's plain and simple words. He did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Yet these lying preachers teach this whole world today that the Savior came and did away with all those old Jewish laws. Okay, even though they see that, you know, even though, you can point, even though it can be pointed out, the minds of the people are blinded because they've been, it's been drilled into them that the preachers aren't going to lie to them. That they aren't going to, that the preachers won't lie. Because they are men of God. They won't lie. But yet when you compare what they teach to the Holy Scriptures, it proves them as liars. But these false preachers, they bring forth a false savior that your own Bible doesn't even speak of. Remember the missing records of the, of the Council of Nicaea? I think that was in this last prophetic word that we read, in the last prophetic word or the last newsletter. I don't remember which, it might have, it might have been in both of them. Um, but it talks about the theological creation of Jesus Christ and how that was done through the Council of Nicaea. Because Constantine was trying to unite everybody in, under his control into a, they wanted, he wanted a universal God that everybody could agree upon and that could unite everybody as one and hopefully solve the problems that he was experiencing. Well, it didn't work. You know, but I mean, but you can see the, but, but you can see here, pastor was even teaching us this you know, teaching us that back then, and even though he didn't quote it at that point, but he said that this false, this, the, these false preachers are bringing forth a false savior that your own Bible does not speak of at all. They are leading this world deeper and deeper into sin and ultimately to destruction. You know, they're not doing anything to pull themselves out of it, but they're adding, you know, curse upon curse, layer upon layer, you know, like a, you know, they just, they just keep piling it on, you know, and it's, and, and eventually it's going to get to the point where four-fifths of the earth's population is going to wind up being destroyed. But it's these same lying preachers that Yahshua Messiah was speaking of in Matthew 7.23, the same ones who are causing this whole world to practice iniquity, to break the laws of Yahweh. But notice again what Yahshua says to them in this scripture, get away from me. Get away from me, you who practice iniquity, you who break the law of Yahweh. The deception of the devil. Deception of the devil. The Apostle Yachanan addressed the same deception in his writings. In 1 Yachanan 3, 7, he said, let no man deceive you. You know, this warning, you know, these warnings. Pastor brings up these warnings over and over and over again to get it firmly established in our minds that there are men out there trying to deceive. You know, and trying to point out to the people who may be listening to this for the first time or seeing this for the first time. 
that there are people out there trying to deceive. And 1 Jochanan 3.7, he said, Let no man deceive you. He who practices righteousness or obeys Yahweh's every word is righteous just as he or yeah, just as Yahweh is righteous. Remember what we've read in Deuteronomy 6.25. This is your righteousness if you will do them. We have to do them in order for them to be our righteousness. If you will practice the keeping of the Yahweh's laws, statutes, and judgments, then you are righteous. But the Apostle Yochanan also said in 1 Yochanan 3.8, he who commits sin, he who commits sin is of the devil. So he who breaks the law of Yahweh, he who practices this iniquity, belongs to Satan, the adversary. So in 1 Yochanan 3, 4, we've read the scriptural definition of sin, which is the transgression of the law. Therefore, if you practice the committing of sin, you practice breaking the law of Yahweh, you do not belong to Yahweh, but, but to the devil, just as 1 Yochanan 3, 8 plainly shows. He who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Yahweh was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Notice this in the scripture here. Yahshua did not come to destroy the law. You see that? He didn't come to destroy the law. What did he come to do? He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy sin. And that commission is being brought out by the house of Yahweh through our pastor and overseer today. He's been doing it since before the house of Yahweh was established. He was, he'd been teaching against sin. And slowly but surely, more and more people are, are, are coming to the knowledge of the truth. They are understanding that the reason that the world is in such bad shape is because of sin. Because sin and iniquity abounds. Why continue to preach lies? With all these plain, simple scriptures which are written in every Bible, why do these preachers continue to teach lies to the people? Why do they continue to lead this world into death, disease, war, and destruction? The answer is found in Romans 8, 7, which says, to be carnally minded, or the carnal mind, because the carnal mind, remember the carnal mind is the natural mind that each and every one of us is born with. The carnal mind is at enmity against, it's bitterly opposed to Yahweh, for it is not subject to the laws of Yahweh, nor indeed can be. So there you have it, Pastor Shows. He says, there you have it, there's the answer, and this is the way it is. You know, you can almost see it like a news report, and there you have it. The carnally minded person cannot uphold the law of Yahweh. They cannot uphold the law of Yahweh. He or she is bitterly opposed to these laws, and the only thing waiting for them is found in Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded, to be fleshly minded, to be, to be tied up with the ways of this world, to have all of these things in our mind, to be seeking after those things, to be carnally minded is death. It's not going to lead to anything else. You know, look at, what lust has, look at what lust has led to. Yes, lust has not only led to uh, diseases, but what else has lust led to? Jealousy, war, murder, bitterness, hatred. It leads to all of those things. The carnally minded... To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, to be spiritually minded, well, when we, we have to think about what it means to be spiritually minded. Yahweh doesn't leave us, he doesn't leave us to, to come up on our own minds what it means to be spiritually minded. Remember what Romans 7.14 says? Romans, uh, Romans, uh, Romans 7.14 says, for the law is spiritual. So to be carnally minded, to be focused on the way of this world, on the way that this world is going and the things that are in this world, for the, like, you know, for the lust of the world and the pride of life and all that is in it, is passing away. But he who does the will of Yahweh, they will abide forever. You know, he who seeks first the kingdom of Yahweh, he who has a spiritual mind, this law is spiritual. He who seeks to attain the perfect character of Yahweh, you know, in that is life and peace. In the laws of Yahweh is life and peace. For 6,000 years, mankind has been going the way of Cain. They have been going the way of 
of vengeance and retaliation. They've been going the way of lust. They've been going the way of, of fulfilling the pleasures of the flesh, whatever that may be. And what has it led to? Well, all we have to do is take a look at the news and see what it's led to. Look in the schools and see what it's led to in the schools. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And, you know, and this is things that as men of Yahweh, as being called into Yahweh's house, Yahweh has shown us these things. You know, this is the blessing. We see the results of sin. We know what's causing it. Why would we want to go back into that system? Why would anybody want to go back into that system knowing what it's, knowing what it's going to cause, knowing that the hurt and pain that it's going to cause? You know, if you're, if you, you know, if you're getting out of your car and you shut the car door on your hand, it's going to hurt, right? I mean, it's, it's going to hurt. Okay, well, knowing that, are you going to open up the car door and slam it on your hand again and keep doing that over and over and over again? You're not going to do that. But this world, you know, they've been doing the same thing for 6,000 years and there's never been any improvement. It's gotten worse and worse and worse, and it's going to continue to get worse. Revelation 22, 14 through 15, blessed are those who do his, Yahweh's commandments. Here we are, the last book in the Bible, the last book in the Holy Scriptures, the last chapter, and the book of Yahweh is on the last page. Blessed are those who keep his laws, who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. They have a legal right to that tree of life and may enter into the gates through the city. For outside, who is going to be left out? Who is going to be prevented? Who is not going to be allowed through? It says, for outsider dogs, you know, and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers. You know, think about what it is, you know, think about what a murderer is. A murderer is somebody who simply hates their brother. And God worshipers, Satan worshipers, devil worshipers. What is it? What does it take for somebody to be a devil worshiper? They're not going to be allowed in the kingdom. And everyone who professes to love yet practices breaking the law, they are going to be outside. This is why it is so important for us to search in order to find out cons uh, conclusively if there is sin in anything that we do. You know, the Day of Atonement is, you know, the, the Day of Atonement is what, roughly, what, 90 days away, 89 days away now? 88, 89, somewhere around there, roughly three months, uh, roughly about three months away. You know, examining ourselves is something that we should be doing daily. You know, you know, the apostle Jacob, he, you know, he, he talks about the, the laws of Yahweh. He talks about the laws of Yahweh being like a mirror, you know, and we go up there and we look at the laws of Yahweh and we look in that mirror and the whole purpose of going into a mirror and looking at a mirror is to say, okay, well, do I have any hair out of place? Do I have any hair? You know, I mean, some of us, we're, not, we're kind of losing it a little bit. But do I have any hair out of place? Do I have any dirt on my face? Do I have anything stuck in my teeth? Okay, if you look in the, law, if you look in the mirror and you see something stuck in your teeth, are you going to leave it in there? No. If you have a big old smudge mark on your forehead, are you going to leave it there? No. What are you going to do? You're going to take, you're going to clean it off. You're going to wipe it off, right? Well, the laws of Yahweh are the same. We should be examining ourselves. And we have the opportunity, men, to do this every week. We have the opportunity to go before Yahweh in confession. You know, we need to make sure, you know, we really need to diligently examine ourselves and to see, are we walking in the laws of Yahweh? Are we truly, you know, are, are we truly, you know, striving to be the spiritually minded person? You know, and it, it takes a lot of effort. Yahshua Messiah showed, you know, how much effort that it took. I mean, you, you look at the things, men, that we face every day. You look at some of the habits that we have every day, and these habits are very difficult to overcome. And it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of thought. But with the thought, with the effort, with the concentration, you know, there, we're going to notice that we start practicing and we start, we, we, we're not going to be doing those things as much. 
we may not notice it, but the more we work at it, the less and less that we're going to see, the less and less that we're going to be committing those things. We're going to be doing those things. And if you take a look at where we were, if we have a bad habit, you know, you look at where we were when it came out about certain words that we don't use. Remember how many times we messed up with that? Remember how many times that, oh man, I'm not supposed to say that. And then two seconds later, oh man, I did it again. I mean, it was a constant thing. But through the persistence in doing that, what took place? Over a period of time, we're not saying them near as much. And we still may mess up every once in a while, but we've made progress. And it's that way with every aspect of our life. And this is why the pastor says here, it's so important for us to search in order to find out conclusively if there, if there is sin in anything that we do. And if we, if we have it, you know, if, if we find it, we need to confess it. And then we need to, we, we need, if, maybe we need to seek counsel on how to overcome this thing. But that's the blessing that we have. You know, we have a tremendous blessing to be able to go to the priest and to be able to confess these things so that we can be forgiven for them and then to have the counsel on how can we overcome these things. You know, but it has to come, it has to come from us. We have to have that desire to be able to do that. And if we, and if we, you know, this is why it's so important for us, Pastor shows here, to search in order to find out conclusively if there is sin in anything that we do. If it is sin, then it is of the devil. We have to remember that. If it's sin, if it's breaking the law of Yahweh, it's not of Yahweh, it's of Satan, the adversary. And if we practice sin, then we are of the devil and not of Yahweh. You know, we want to make sure, we want to strive. You know, so we're going to have difficulties. Yes, we're going to have difficulties. But it's our effort. How much effort are we putting into it? The more effort we put into it, the easier it's going to get and the more we're going to progress. Okay? We're going to stop here. I went a little bit over. We're going to stop here on page 80. At the top of the page here where it says, Evil fruit. May Yahweh be with you and bless you. Uh, may Yahweh bless your work week and uh, keep you safe. And we look forward to everybody gathering once again here in about six and a half days, five, six days or so for the weekly Sabbath. May Yahweh be with you and bless you. If everyone will stand, we'll go ahead and we'll close.